Good afternoon, everybody. Happy Tuesday. Today is one of those days in which our bi-weekly lecture is going to be delivered by a guest. Uh, and our guest lecture is Professor Arne Wested. Arne Wested studied history, philosophy, and modern languages at the University of Oslo before doing a graduate degree in US and international history at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Before joining the faculty at Yale, where he is the Elihu Professor of History, he held positions at the London School of Economics and Harvard University. Professor Westhead has published 16 books, most of which deal with 20th century Asian and global history. He is one of the world's leading historians of the Cold War, which he worked on for a significant part of his career, writing important work about the Soviet bloc and the People's Republic of China. He now specializes in the histories of empire and imperialism, as well as China's place in the international order. Today, in one of our very last meetings of this course, he will deliver a lecture about comparative Russian imperialism. Arne, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Victor, for that generous introduction. Um, I can see the Russian Empire up here flicking off and on, and that's a little bit like what the Russian Empire has been over a long period of time. So maybe that's illustrative of what we're going to talk about today. So I think the reason why I've been asked to do this lecture is that I teach a class this semester here at Yale uh, on comparative empires and imperialisms. So where we look at the transformations of empires going back to the mid 19th century and all the way up to the US empire today. Um, it's, a, it's an undergraduate seminar. And I hope the undergraduates enjoy it half as much as what I do. So the purpose of the lecture um, is trying to understand better how Russian imperialism versus Ukraine today fits into a bigger context. So both of Russia's own past as an empire, but also that of other empires. And I think one of the problems that we've had um, conceptually and, and interpretatively with regard to Russia's war on, of aggression this year is that it hasn't been understood enough in terms of those contexts. Uh, and I hope this class overall have helped the people who are here or those who are watching understand that aspect of the conflict better. Because it is to me crucial, not just in terms of the conduct of the war, but also how the war is going to end. Without understanding that deeper background, it's really hard to get to understand that. So I'm going to be looking, as I said, at Russia's own past. I'm also going to be looking, although briefly, at China, at France, at Britain, and to some extent, the United States, which also, I think, in terms of its past, certainly best should be understood as an empire. I'm going to start with the drivers of Russian imperialism coming out of the 19th century that stayed with us for a very long time. And you will hear resonances of these today. I'm going to talk about the competition between the Russian Empire and other empires in Europe and outside of Europe. I'm going to talk in particular about the Qing Empire in China, um, the Ottoman Empire in, 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 in the Middle East and, and Eastern Europe, and, and Britain just to get a, a sense of how this element of competition came to frame much of the thinking, both back in the, in the early 20th century, but also today about Russia's place in the world. Then I'm going to do, in the, in the third substantial part, more of a direct comparison between Russia in its relationship to Ukraine and Britain, really meaning England, in its relationship to Ireland, and France in its relationship to Algeria. And I pick these up, not because they're identical, they're not identical, but they have a lot in common in terms of how long the involvement has lasted, but also crucially to me that this is a matter of decolonization. Right? Even though these areas, these countries are close to the imperial centers, Ireland and Algeria, their evolution has been an evolution driven in the 20th century by decolonization. And what I'm indicating here, of course, is that the relationship between 
Russia and Ukraine is in many ways similar in character, not in, in every context of those relationships. And then I'm going to finish uh, before we hopefully have time for just a couple of questions about talking about what drives Russian imperialism today, especially but not exclusively with regard to Ukraine. So that's the overall framework for this, for this lecture. And some of this, of course, you will have touched upon before, but probably not in the context that we are trying to draw up today. So let me start then with the drivers of Russian imperialism. Is there anyone who can stop that map from flicking on and off? Press the escape button. That seems to be a good idea. So we're going to start by thinking about the drivers of Russian imperialism, the way that it came out of the 19th century. Uh, some of these drivers, in my view, as you will hear later on in the lecture, have stayed relatively intact, and others have changed. So it's not a, the argument I'm putting forward here is not an argument about absolute continuity. It is about the need to understand the starting point for many of these forms of thinking, without which I think we are lost in our attempt at understanding what is the situation today. <laughs> it's this one, it's not me. <laughs> Probably. It should have been a red phone, right? <laughs> so the first of these drivers is also the most complex one. It's a sense on the Russian side, I mean, within the Russian elite or elites, of uniqueness, of exceptionalism, of standing apart as an empire from other empires. Now, Russia, you underline this, Russia is not the only empire that thinks of itself in that way. You are sitting here within an empire that thinks of itself very much in that way. Right? What is a little bit special with Russia is how comprehensively some of these ideas developed from, from, fairly, from fairly early on. About religion, um, about authenticity, which is a term that is often used uh, for the Russian speakers here, um, which can be translated in many different ways, but self-being. Very often, and I think most correctly, certainly in the context of the 19th century, translated as at, at, authentic, at authenticity, being close to the people, having a certain almost mystical connection between elites, then of course being imperial elites, and the vast majority of people who were included in the empire. Not just Russians, it should be said, but everyone that was included within the, uh, within the empire. A genuine understanding of people's wishes that other empires, according to these texts, did not, did not possess. Um, a search for a genuine order that could represent those wishes of the people. Of course, leading to the idea or the ideal of benign authoritarian rule. And you will hear much of this being reflected uh, in some of the discourses later on as well. In speaking of this, by the way, I'm reminded of the great British historian uh, Sir Lewis Namia. I don't know if Namia's name has come up uh, earlier in this series of lectures. He was one of the people, though most of his work was on British constitutional history, who gave voice to this idea about a particular link between Russia, Russian Empire, and authenticity. So Namia was born in Warsaw in the late 19th century uh, under the name of Bernstein. He then moved with his family to Ternopil, where he grew up, uh, polified, is that the, is that the word? Uh, polifying his name to Niemirovsky, which then became Namia when he came to Britain as a as a student. Authenticity was the term that he often used. He hated the Polish Republic. He hated Germany even more. He was ambivalent on Ukraine, but he was big on Russia because it was authentic. 
in a way that other empires, including the British Empire, which he served for most of his life, were not. So this is the first driver, uniqueness, exceptionalism, authenticity. The second one, it seems to me, is the emphasis within the official discourse of expansion as being defensive. Now, again, other empires do this as well. There is always a border that needs to be pacified. We're going to talk about the Qing Empire later on. Always a border to be pacified. The British Empire, you know, stumbled into its empire, it, its empire uh, etc. But it's never emphasized as deeply and for as long, in my view, as the expansion of the Russian Empire. And much of it was then rubbed off in a somewhat different form to the Soviet Union when that was reconstituted uh, uh, later on within what had been the Russian Empire. Now, some of this is easy to understand, the emphasis on defense. Part of the reason is that Russia, of course, confronted empires east and west that for most of its existence were much stronger than Russia itself. In, in, in Europe, for sure, but also the Ottomans, and certainly the Qing in, in East Asia. As the Russian Empire discovered fairly early in its expansion east, you didn't mess with the Qing. That was not a good idea. It was probably in terms of sheer military capability combined with an ideology of aggression, the one that you really didn't want to come up against. So this idea of expansion as being defensive in order to meet challenges but other empires that are stronger, very significant in the 19th century. Then thirdly, expansion as opportunistic. And this is the one that is most problematic in a way to deal with because it isn't 100% true. I mean, it's not arguing that there weren't plans for expansion within the Russian Empire in the 19th century. There certainly were such plans. But in a way, I would argue that were much less carried through on in the Russian Empire than in any other empire that I know, including the ones that I mentioned so far. Part of the explanation for that is, of course, the, the relative weakness that I have already referred to. But then, of course, making use from the mid-19th century on of a unique moment when the Eastern, and here I would include Britain, meaning British India, the Eastern empires that Russia confronted got into trouble, all three of them, the Qing, the British, and the Ottomans, roughly at the same time. The Qing, mainly for domestic reasons, I would argue, and then followed by, by, by confrontations with Western imperialism. The, the Ottomans, because of, of the beginning of nationalist organizations in part of the Ottoman Empire, especially in the European part, and the British because of the rebellion in India in the, in the 1850s. So instead of pushing outwards, these empires start to step aside, opening up for a remarkable period of Russian imperial expansion. Now, that's opportunistic. It's opportunistic for a reason, and that reason is the weakness of others, but it also tells you something about the ability to act. And that is, that is what happened in the late 19th century. And the result you see up here in terms of this is the Russian Empire, I know 1914 or thereabouts. With, if you look at the red line, which is the one that we're really preoccupied with, massive expansion of territory. Then, fourthly, a driver of Russian imperialism coming out of the 19th century is the emphasis on hierarchy, bureaucracy, incorporation of elites. Also meaning, of course, non-Russian elites. So again, these are characteristics you would find in any empire, but particularly the emphasis on the incorporation is something that the Russian Empire took very far. M most of the people, I think Putin would be profoundly shocked if he reflected on this, but most of the people who constituted the expansionist elite in the Russian Empire were not Russian. They came out of other, mainly European, though not, not exclusively, uh, peoples that were part of the Russian Empire in the 19th century. They staffed and manned it, and they were the bureaucrats that came to serve it, which was part, in a way, of the, of, of, of the promise that the, the empire presented uh, to them in terms of how 
working for and with the Russian Empire could serve a lot of people who were not necessarily Russian, or, or per perhaps even more crucially, had not been born in a dominion of the Tsar. That worked, and it worked for a very, very long time. Um, it wasn't uncontroversial, certainly not in the areas that had been colonized. Neither was it uncontroversial within Russia itself. But it was a powerful aspect of how the Russian Empire worked. Uh, people who were born, grew up in Ukraine, for instance, in many cases, went to serve the Russian Empire in, in faraway places. Uh, Poles, Bolts, Germans, Belarusians, you have it. Uh, I, I won't go through all the different groups that served in these kinds of, these kinds of roles. So hierarchy, bureaucracy, and cooperation. Of course, a driver of Russian expansionism was also the exploitation of resources. So for those who are already thinking, aha, here is Professor Westerd arguing a completely idealistic understanding of Russian imperialism, not so. I mean, there were motives that were dri driven by the wish for exploitation of resources outside what had been the established borders of the empire. What is remarkable, though, about the Russian Empire for a very, very long time was that it was relatively ineffective in exploiting those resources. So this was not for a lack of trying, but if you look at this map, and you will have heard this many times, I'm sure, in this class, distance sometimes defeated the best purpose of exploitation. Right? You could grab the resources, as all imperialists do, that you want and that you need, but could you easily bring them to market, which here would be mainly in the West, did you even necessarily want to bring them to market when you could use them to strengthen the state much more locally? You know, those are questions that need to be asked about the Russian Empire. Um, so saying that this is not about the exploitation of resources, as almost all imperial ventures are, would be wrong. But it's also important to remember how relatively ineffect ineffective, inefficient for a very long time uh, uh, the Russian Empire's exploitation of these resources were. And then the final driver that I'm going to mention, there are many, but it has to stop somewhere, is about settlement. So again, if you look at the map, you should have had a map that indicated where people from various parts of Russia settled during the empire. But especially after emancipation, this from the 1860s on, you have a massive expansion of settlement in various parts of Russia, far from where people were born. So I'm not just saying that it was former serfs who settled. They were a fairly large number, but there were also other kinds of peoples. The, the empire, in a way, opened up for settlement. For those of you uh, who are here primarily because of your interest in Ukrainian history, um, you should look at where Ukrainians have ended up all over the, the Russian Empire. Maybe especially look at the Far East and what is today the Maritime Provinces, which has a very large number uh, of people from Ukraine uh, settling. This is important because not all empires settle, right? Um, there are some, Russia is among them, where settlement, trans-settlement, whatever you want to call it, is, a, is an important part of the drivers. We're going to come back to this a little bit later on. And there are others that do much less of it. And then, of course, there are the hybrid ones, like the British Empire, that would settle in some areas, which is part why a fairly large number of you are here today, um, settle North America, would, would, would settle uh, Australia, would settle parts of Africa and carrying out at least episodic acts of genocide as they did so. But then in other parts of the British Empire, settlement was not on the agenda. There was very little British settlement in India, uh, for instance. Uh, and we can, if you are interested in comparative imperial history, we could go further into why, why that was so. I often use the example of Korea. So Korea was in some kind of union, in a very broad sense, being linked to uh, Chinese empires for a very, very long time. But there were no Chinese attempts at settling Chinese people in Korea during that time period. 
From the early 20th century, Korea became gradually a part of the Japanese Empire. And the Japanese settled in very large numbers. So it's important, particularly for those of you who have an interest in concepts linked to settler colonialism, it's important to understand what this is really about and, and, and what the forces are, the drivers of it, why it comes out the way it does. So these are the drivers of Russian imperialism at the higher level, the way, the way I see them. So let's then turn to the issue of, of competition that I mentioned uh, originally. And I do think that this is important in order to understand why we ended up with a Russian empire that controlled all of this enormous landmass that we are that we are looking at here. So, and you will know this, and I'm not going to dwell on it. Russian expansion towards the east and towards the south and into other parts of Europe started quite early. You know, we're talking about the 17th century, even the early 17th century. But of course, during that time period, as I already said, the Russian Empire had to be very careful not to come up against stronger empires, would basic, which would basically whack them if they tried to get into the areas that were, con were contested. So most of that expansion went northward and eastward into areas in which the anti-imperial resistance were much weaker. That was a story for a very, very long time. And it's really... It's really the 19th century that changes this. Um, as I already indicated, and it's important sometimes to recognize this in history, uh, the Russian Empire in many ways got lucky. Uh, it got lucky with the Qing, it got lucky with the Ottomans, it got lucky with the British for no reason connected to the Russian Empire itself. Right? There was the opportunity to expand into enormous areas because of that weakness of, of Russia's opponents. So you see that here along the borders of the Russian Empire, uh, going into the Caucasus, going into Central Asia, the southern parts of Central Asia, which had been an absolute no-no because if you went in there, you got in trouble with the Qing. And then, of course, ultimately in the, in the Far East, the, and what became the maritime provinces were taken directly from the Qing Empire when, it got, when the Qing got into real trouble in the, in the late 19th century. I think we can learn a lot about how empires behave if we think about them in terms of competition. Right? Not just each empire for itself, which generally has been the approach, but also how empires learn from each other, how they see each other. Um, my Princeton colleague, Jeremy Edelman, has written really well on this. I mean, how empires take over characteristics, take over imperial technologies from others. And in many ways, this is what Russia then proceeded to do in the 19th century. Of course, not just in the areas that were, t were taken over, but in other parts of the Russian Empire as well. This sudden explosion in expansion also gave rise to much of this restlessness that took place in other parts of Russia, which eventually would lead up to the fatal engagement in the war in, in 1914 and then to, to the collapse of the Russian Empire in the revolution. A collapse that quite a number of historians will explain at least in part by overstretch, uh, that they were trying to do too many things at the same time and therefore failed. There's a lot to be said for that. Our Yale colleague Paul Kennedy's term imperial overstretch I think is incredibly well applied uh, to Russia in the, in the late 19th century. So comparison is not just a issue by issue comparison, at least to me. Comparison can also tell us a great deal when you think about it in a, in a broader context, when you think about it in a societal context, an economic context, and maybe first and foremost in a state context. State, not just about political systems, but about how one creates, or tries to create, capable states. 
that respond to these kinds of, of imperial, imperialist uh, opportunities as they come out. Now, I thought at this point that it could be quite helpful for us to explore some of the categories, that, most of which we have already touched upon, in terms of drawing a more immediate comparison, as I said to begin with, um, between Russia, Britain, and France. I'm not picking these three because they are the only three that you could possibly compare. I mentioned the Qing, I mentioned, I mentioned the United States. Um, but there is something in particular about the start of expansion with these empires, uh, Russia, Britain, France, that I think can be quite illustrative. And many people now, last decade or so, who want to work on comparative empires and imperialisms, have started looking at these factors, uh, with Ukraine being a significant part of it in terms of its relationship to Russia. And the, the parallels then, as I said to begin with, is the English in Ireland and the French in Algeria. Both early attempts at colonization that lasted for a very long time and ultimately failed. Uh, they failed because the people who lived in these regions took on identities, accepted identities, worked through identities that were not commensurate with the imperial project that had been put on them from the, from the outside. Even though significant elements, think language, uh, remained after that imperial period was over. Uh, Anti-colonial revolutionaries in Algeria, mainly wrote in French. Um, the activists of the Sinn Féin and of the Irish Republican Army used almost exclusively English. So there are things that do, that do remain. But let's look at this in terms of some more specific uh, comparisons. One, and here we get to go back to that term again, is of course about settlement. This is difficult because settlement happened in slightly different forms in these three countries, so in Algeria, in, in Ireland, and in, and in Ukraine. So in Ireland, settlement, English settlement, happened more or less all over the country, but then increasingly, and here we see a parallel to Ukraine, increasingly as industrialism started to take hold in the most resource-rich, energy-rich parts of the country, meaning the north. Right? And the parallel here, of course, is to Donbass and the eastern, the eastern parts of, of Ukraine in, in, in particular. There's also a parallel to France in, in Algeria, um, where it was the most productive, but mainly in agricultural terms, areas along the coast that were colonized by French-speaking people, not necessarily people who came from France, but people whose main language was French and moved into these areas under the auspices of the, of the French Empire. In all three of these countries, in terms of settlement activities, the native population were mainly excluded. Not fully excluded, but mainly excluded. And the, argument that we, the arguments that were being used for this were of different kinds. One had to do with education and skills, which of course the empire that was in control deliberately deprived the people they were ruling over of. So it was a, if you ever heard of a self-fulfilling prophecy, you can, you can see that that one is there. But also of course loyalty to the imperial project, which was very, very significant. Um, probably, as we already touched upon, in all three of these cases, um, particularly in the late 19th century, settlement was a part of expanding one's own population overseas. And in these cases, of course, in areas that were pretty close to the imperial mother country, uh, which is important in this, in this context. But the comparisons here are not just about settlement. They're also about incorporation. And this is when things, I think, get really interesting. 
the idea at the imperial center of these countries, which had, for most of their countries, had a separate existence, being an integral part of the imperial homeland. Not just the imperial state. Imperial states are vast, you know, over to the peripheries. And no one would, or very few people, especially if you're not French, would make an argument that these faraway places actually are a part of France, or part of whatever. Right? But if you happen to be next door, it is more problematic in many ways. So you get this argument in the late 19th century, which has resonated all the way down to very close to today, um, that Ireland really belongs to Britain. It is part of the British Isles. Right? Uh, it should be incorporated. More incorporation is what is necessary, not less incorporation. Until, of course, the British hit at one of the weaker moments in history an armed rebellion that they couldn't overcome, that established an Irish, an Irish state. But in the process of that, this is where incorporation really resonates, uh, the British kept hold of the north, of the northern parts of Ireland, which had been the part that had been mostly settled. Uh, by English people, Scottish people, other people from the empire who'd come in to work at the factories and work in, in the areas in the, in the north. In the Franco-Algerian situation, things were even worse in terms of finding a solution. Because as many of you will know, in the 19, late 1940s and 1950s, the position that the French state took was that Algeria was an integral part of France. Even considering any form of autonomy, never mind independence for Algeria, was tantamount to devaluing the whole significance and position of the French state, which is why that war of independence became so incredibly vicious. Right? Because it had to do with identity, and in identity both within the former colonized area and within the imperial center. Exploitation is an important part of this. And various kinds of exploitation of, of near areas in terms of, um, in terms of empire. I think there are some parallels here as well with regard to, with regard to these three. When I say exploitation, I'm not always thinking about it in sort of purely material terms, though that is a significant part of it, as I have already, as I have already described. Uh, but it, it, it goes further than that. It's also making use of the manpower, for instance, for wars, for further wars of expansion. Um, if you look at the number of, of Algerians that served in France's wars during the 20th century especially, uh, it's a very, very large number. Um, the number of Irish people who served in various British armies, sometimes as the front troops for these armies, also very, very high. Right? Uh, so it's not just about economic exploitation. It's also exploitation of the, of the manpower um, that, is, that is actually there. It's also other forms of exploitation. Sexual exploitation is one part of this in a gendered sense, which I think is really important to, to, to emphasize. Um, it's exploitation in terms of uh, when you have more development, uh, as you did during the mid uh, 20th century, exploitation of resources in terms of everything from, from currency to fuel. Uh, so th there is a, when you think about imperialist exploitation in these near context, you sort of ha have to take the smash and grab version, right, of exploitation that most of us think of in imperialist terms and magnify it, look at it through a slightly different lens. In part because the cases that I'm talking about here were not cases of resources having to be brought in from afar. They were, they were pretty close and, and easily easily accessible. So settlement, incorporation, exploitation, and then, and then finally 
cultural hegemony. And I'm going to dwell on this a little bit because I think it is hugely important for all three of these cases. So I talked about uh, language to begin with in this, in this part and how language had been used in order to incorporate um, certainly elites, but after a while the further afield as well, into the, imperial, into the imperial project. Ukraine is, of course, the best example that I know of, of this, right? Um, but uh, Ireland and, and, and Algeria would not be far behind. Uh, prioritizing the culture of the colonizer is, as Edward Said and others have told us, a really important aspect of continuing the imperial tradition, sort of driving on the kind of issues that come from the earliest period um, of empire and of, and of imperialism. It's also a way in which imperial powers almost always create divisions within the countries that they are in control of. And culture here is probably more important than straightforward politics. It brings us back to what we talked about at the beginning of this lecture in, in terms of identities, in terms of discouraging dissent among the colonized because the cultural power of the colonizer is so much greater. For instance, we are international, we are global, we are a great power. You're a superpower, while you are not, right? You are local. So culture works in that way, I think, with regard to imperial projects. And probably it's the last thing to go. Right? As I, uh, I think it's pretty clear in, in, in the case of Ukraine and eminently visible in the case of, of Algeria and, and Ireland. This is, this is certainly so. And it is an issue. Um, it's an issue that... Of course, only colonized people after decolonization can deal with themselves successfully. But it is, a, it is an important issue. So I wanted to make sure that we have a little bit of time at the end for questions. So I'm just going to make some final remarks. Uh, first about Russian imperialism today uh, versus Ukraine. But then I think more importantly in terms of what I know something about um, how the effects of this war are going to resonate on the Russian side in terms of dealing with the past, including the deeper, the deeper past. So I have absolutely no doubt, as you might have guessed uh, in terms of how I framed this lecture, that Russian imperialism today versus Ukraine will end in the same way as England and Ireland, and France in Algeria, in, in decolonization, in spite of neo-colonial wars. So, I mean, the Russians in Ukraine in, in 2022 are not the first ones who engage in neo-colonial wars. I mean, Algeria and, in my view, Ireland are also good examples of it. You find it in almost all parts of the world. This idea that if a formal association in terms of empire is gone, that that's the end of the story. Almost in all imperial contexts, not so. Um, this continues to be problematic for a very long time uh, after that. And part of the reason for that, I argue, is that these positions are so closely bound up in identities, in core identities for many of the people who are involved not just on the side of the colonized, but perhaps even more powerfully on the side of the colonizers. Um, and this is what we sometimes do not understand well enough, uh, maybe especially in the Russian case, because this has been, including the collapse of the Soviet Union, such a long and outdrawn, outdrawn affair. This is, in many ways, about Russian identity. Um, and it is, in my view, first and foremost, identity in Russia uh, in the sense of an inability to deal meaningfully with the past. Um, I spent a lot of time 
in Moscow in the early 1990s. Uh, as Victor said, I, I, I worked on the, on the history of the Cold War. There was no better opportunity for an historian of the Cold War than to be in Moscow in the early 1990s when the archives started to open up and you could get access. And you know, I also then was witness to how people almost overnight went from belonging to one of the two superpowers, which gave immense pride to a lot of people in Russia, over onto being next to nothing. You know, people starving, people in Moscow, elderly people starving to death in 1993. Thereabouts. So that sense of collapse, being déclassé, everything taken away, is a very important reason, I think, why Putin has been able to develop uh, Russia, or not develop Russia, in the direction that he has. He, of course, also manipulates very effectively, at least up to the war in Ukraine began, the image globally of the Soviet era as a kind of anti-empire. While in reality, of course, the Soviet Union kept some, not all, but some of those visions of empire relatively intact. So what Russia needs, in my view, more, probably more than anything else, except regime change, is a reckoning with the past. Um, just like there is a need to discuss slavery and settler colonialism in Europe and in, in, in the Americas and elsewhere, there is also a, a deep need for Russians to discuss the effect the empire has had on those at the receiving end, but also, and maybe more fundamentally, on Russians themselves. Um, because it's, it's very difficult, as this country, the United States, is, is slowly realizing, to be an empire and a republic. To be an empire... Uh, so never mind a democracy, but even a functioning, functioning republic at, at the same time. So these forms of what I call hybrid exceptionalism that uh, Vladimir Putin has been using in his war of aggression against Ukraine. When, when Foreign Minister Lavrov at the beginning of the conflict spoke about Ukraine as being a Russian sphere of privileged interest, you can see how that, that resonates with some of these drivers of Russian imperialism that I've been talking about today. So, you know, on the Russian side, it is as important to deal with this in terms of empire as it is to deal with it in terms of war. So that's what I had to say. And we have time, I think, exactly five minutes for, for questions, if there were people who wanted to ask. Please. Is there any conflict between this Russian sense of authenticity as an imperial motivation and the fact that many of the servants of imperialism were Russian and therefore had some kind of authentic Russian identity? Is there any conflict I think there are some links. Um, I mean, one I think is that it is the imperial institution in itself that is unique in a way. You sort of project it upwards. You can see some tendencies to that during the Soviet era and the post-Soviet era as well. This idea of inclusive representation, right? Um, people have written whole books about this comparing the late imperial era in Russia and the Soviet Union, right? This idea of representing something that is much bigger than Russia, much bigger than the Soviet peoples themselves, that is immensely attractive to others. Now, for most of the time, it should be said, with regard to the Russian Empire, that wasn't so, with some Balkan exceptions. People were incorporated into the empire by force and not by choice. Right? Um, but you can still see how it could work. Right? This idea that you represent some bigger idea um, that is not even necessarily Russian in nature, but has the Russian state, the Russian imperial state in this case, at, as its center. Other questions? Yeah. You hinted that um, what you think Russia needs is regime change and a reckoning with the past. Do you think that if, when regime change does come, they will bring this reckoning with the past, or no? I certainly, I certainly hope so. The track record is not particularly good. 
uh, with, rega with regard to this. Um, look, there's been over the last 20 years in Russia, and I'm sure all of you are aware of that, a, a very specific set of attempts of moving away from dealing with the past in any, in any meaningful sense. I mean, to, to some extent, that is what uh, the Putin regime has been about, right? A, 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 a kind of denial of everything that has happened before. Not always in a specific sense. It's very interesting, this, right? So, um, as an archival historian, I found it fascinating that in the very last two, three years before the invasion of Ukraine, Putin, we know that it was Putin himself, acted to open up many archives from the Soviet era. And we don't know the reason why that was so. I have a strong suspicion that the real reason was to compare his own, his own regime favorably with what had been the failure of the Soviets. I mean, Putin, as you will know, one of his constituent elements is that he is an anti-communist. You know, he, he believes that the communist era, in spite of the little parenthesis around the, the Great Patriotic War, uh, that communism was bad for Russia, bad for Russians. It might have been good for other peoples in the empire, but it was bad for, it was bad for Russians. So I think you have to have a pretty uh, significant change, not just in terms of the regime itself, which can go in any direction. I'm not in any way foreseeing that what comes after Putin for Russians necessarily is better than Putin. But in terms of, in terms of thinking about the past, I think it's more significant in terms of society than it is, that it is significant in terms of the state. Of course, the state must not resist it or, or disallow it. But my greatest shock with regard to the 2014 invasion, invasions uh, and the 2022 invasions was how many ordinary Russians who were at least a step of the way carried along by this pack of, of, of lies and half-truths that, that Putin presented as the justification for colonial wars. And that tells me that there is a lot of work in, you know, among Russians themselves to do to understand how they are held back by this imperial mindset. Because as I, I said in the case of the other examples, you know, this always ends badly in, in, you know, when you have gotten to the, the early part of the 21st century. One final question, if there is one. If not, let me make one, one very brief point at the end. So, in this lecture, I've tried to look at sort of the long durée, the kind of trajectories that come out of the past, even the deeper past. I've not done so trying to tell you that history explains everything. It doesn't. There are new directions, new tra trajectories that are not necessarily connected to the past. But if you want to try to understand terms, terminologies, parts of language, ideas and identities, then history can be a great guide. Because history brings something to the table in terms of understanding the present, which can explain things that otherwise would be really, really hard to explain. So that's in a way my message in this lecture. It doesn't explain everything. But it's hard to make do without it because of the things that it can help you to understand. All right, thank you very much.